Okay, guys, we're starting with the opening brochas. I'm going to have you all in mind, and may Hashem be happy with our learning. Baruch atah Adonai lohinu melech valam. Asher kerishan v'mitzotah v'tzivanu la'asuk v'divrei Torah. Barev na Adonai lohinu itivrei Torah tcha v'finu v'fiyam tcha b'ech Yisrael. V'niye anachnu v'tzeitzeinu v'tzeitzei am tcha b'ech Yisrael. Kulani yodeya shemecham v'lomdei Torah tech nishma. Baruch atah Adonai lohinu melech Torah la'amu Yisrael. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, so, I'm just going to uh, put on my particular time. What I was going to say to you guys is in terms of uh, halacha, this particular pasha that's coming up, uh, uh, Shalach, is dealing with the mitzvah of tzitzit. So I thought as part of the halochas, if we just deal with a couple of practical things with regards to sitzit, it's going to be very, very helpful. So now I swear to do halochas that are relevant to the Pasha. Um, so just one thing I want, wanted you to, to know, just on a practical level, is that if many of you don't like we- having that feeling of wearing sitzit, what should happen is when you do shakrit, because there are people of different religious levels that... Uh, are in the group and apart from that sometimes it can feel quite uh, scratchy or itchy or if you're doing gym etc you don't have to uh, necessarily wear them on what I do sometimes if I'm not feeling in a particular state of mind is I use sit sit for shakrit and then if I'm going to be doing gym or something like that I take it off the main thing is to do the broker and wear the garment every day when you have a four corner garment um, then obviously sit sit is required, and it is a lovely mitzvah to have. If you have to look in terms of a priority between tefillin and sit sit, there is no actual obligation in the same manner to wear sit sit as tefillin. By the way, it's only when you have a four corner garment do you have to have strings and tachelit attached. So, so I'm not encouraging anybody not to wear sit sit. I'm saying if you really not in the stage where you want to wear it. The, what you should do is when you do shakrit, just like you put on uh, to fill in, you put sit sit over your clothes, you do the brocha, etc., and you follow that order. So that would be um, suffice enough to be valid in terms of the mitzvah, just something to uh, bear in mind. And then I, for example, if I'm wearing a, not a suit, because nobody wears towels today, uh, only at the end of the day, sometimes I feel like hanging myself, not in the beginning, but that's what the day goes <laughs> back. Um, yeah. But today with open neck shorts Like you wear, you know, semi-smart um, I like to put a t-shirt on Before I put sit set Because I, your sit set There's a halakhic obligation to keep them white and clean And there's nothing worse than uh, Sweat on it So I always have a t-shirt, then I have sit set Then I'll have a more formal shirt and smart pants um, And I like right. them tucked in I personally don't like uh um, uh, them them out because my medot are not good enough to be almost representative sometimes of a uh, um, from doing that I'm working on myself every day but uh, I often uh, the worst travesty that you can create is a chilul Hashem by the way so you know if you uh, unless your medot are exceptional to look like an orthodox Jew in terms of a kippah and sitzit etc and not behave like one, is more of a transgression than dressing um, modestly to not necessarily indicate that fact. So you're with me. In other words, you can wear a yeah. smartish yeah. hat, a baseball cap, etc., etc., and, and uh, con- uh, concentrate on refining your middle. Just in terms of time requirement, the earliest time to say bracha for tzitzit is from the time period that there's enough light, natural light to be able to distinguish between the white and blue strands within a clump of tzitzit. Um, so the time period is known as the time when I, one is able to recognize an acquaintance from a distance of four cubits. So both descriptions are equivalent and commonly referred to as Mishak Yakir. So there's a different opinions in terms of what this would occur in the perfect day. So for example, in Yerushalayim, it's about 35 minutes before sunrise. There are opinions that it's at altar slightly, but you must be able to discern color tones. All right. So uh, we're going to go through more specific uh, uh, halachas of uh, tzitzit in terms of 
cleaning, when it becomes pasur, when it becomes uh, invalidated, etc., etc. A man from um, a boy from 13 has an obligation to wear uh, tzitzit, and according to Ashkenazis, uh, a talit when a man is married, according to Safadi, uh, at the same age where he's eligible for um, tzitzit and tefillin. All right, so let's go to the Gemara. And we are currently um, on 8A2. And we were talking about a case. Um, we were talking about uh, a case where uh, one, um, one individual bought a pro property on three successive uh, occasions. Okay. So let me just do a summary yesterday quickly on 8A2. So what we said is we were talking about simultaneous purchasing and uh, successive purchasing. Simultaneous is three people buy different grades of land, for example, at one time. How do you technically fulfill uh, doing it at one time? Because obviously if one does it in the morning, one in the afternoon and one in the evening, it's not technically at the same time. But legally it is the same time because remember we said contracts don't discern time of day. They only um, discern date themselves. So that would be known as a purchase at one time, if three people purchased at one time. The other alternative is if one person bought three tracts of land in one particular contract. Okay. What we said yesterday is we hit a problem um, because there wasn't a problem when, um, um, when one person had three tracts of land that they purchased at the same time. Because in that particular case, uh, what would happen is uh, he would uh, satisfy uh, the person that the debtor owed money to as, as the uh, um, purchaser. So in other words, uh, if, if uh, Reuven uh, owed money for damages and uh, he owed money for um, loans as well as owning money for the ketubah, uh, of a of a woman there and he sold the property uh, to Shimon and now Shimon bought all the properties and these three people came to him he would have to satisfy each of them from the tract of land that they deserve in other words damages are paid from superior quality land creditors um, in, in terms of loan repayment would be paid from average land and the uh, kutub of a woman would be paid from inferior quality land the same is if there were three different buyers that purchased at one time, meaning legally in the same day, that each one would satisfy that particular uh, land. So, for example, if damages came, whoever bought the uh, superior land would have to pay for damages. Whoever bought the average land would pay uh, back the lender, and whoever... Um, if the ex-wife came and wanted money for the Kutuba, it would be paid from inferior land. So this is pretty straightforward. Where we have an issue is um, we have an issue when one particular buyer uh, bought, the, bought the land in succession or three particular uh, buyers did. Okay, not when they bought it one time. So what happened, there was a next to last buyer principle. So what, uh, what we said in summary is if there was land unencumbered by the debtor, um, they would have to, the debtor who originally um, had all the tracts of land would have to honor that. So if he sold one of his lands to a buyer, but he had lands left, anybody who uh, still ha had to be paid back by the debtor, <coughs> sorry, with each body to, uh, that had to be paid by, back the, by the debtor could not claim from the buyer because any of the buyers could claim turnarounds and claim that it was the debtor that owed the money and they, leave, they left land unencumbered. What does this mean? It meant that they never purchased all the land. So in other words, this was a rabbinic enactment to protect the buyer. The only person that was landed with the problem was the uh, last purchaser because in purchasing the last tract of land, he didn't enable uh, the debtor to pay back uh, any of the uh, monies owing because he now owns the last body of land and therefore he is responsible. Now, before we go on to the next 
uh, part in 883. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Fine. The Gomorrah yes. analyzes the Brysa. In regards to a case in which the debtor sold all of his properties to one uh, buyer, what were the exact circumstances? This is in 882. It's going to 883 now. What were the exact circumstances of the sale? If you say that the debtor sold all the properties to the buyer at one time, then the ruling would be superfluous. Why is it superfluous, guys? Because we said that um, the buyer would then just honor each tract of land according to what was uh, oh, damages, superior, lender, average, and a kutub of a woman inferior because he owned all the tracts of land. But in a case where the debtor sold the property to three different buyers, where it is at least possible to say that one of them preceded the others in making this purchase, you nevertheless rule that all of them enter into the position of the original owner with respect to collection. So what it's saying there is it's at that point that it brings the enactment uh, stating that, sorry guys, this email is popping in on my system. The, the enactment according to the tour, uh, Hoshan, the Ramban, the Ran, and Rashi, that um, it's, it, it might be discernible from a time period of view, view that they were all in succession, but as long as they purchased it on the same day, because the contracts don't discern time of day, they purchased it simultaneously. And that's why the rule is that they're all into the position of the original owner with respect to collection. Does that make sense? We, this is what yeah. we just discussed. In a case yeah. where he sold the properties to one buyer, is it necessary to state this? Certainly you must pay each creditor with the land that was originally mortgaged to that creditor's debt. Rather, it's obvious that the Bryce speaks of a case in which the buyer bought the property one after the other on three successive days. But this explanation too is difficult. For what is different about the case of three separate buyers? That each one of the first two buyers can say to the creditor, I left a place from which you could collect. In the case of a single buyer as well, regarding each one of the first two lands, that he purchased, let him say to the creditor, I left your place from which you could collect. Thus, the creditor should be able to collect only from the land that the single buyer purchased last, even if, even if it's inferior in quality. Why then does the Bryce rule that each creditor may collect the land that was originally mortgaged to his debt? Okay, so this is the case that we're dealing with. We're saying that whether there were three uh, separate buyers or one single buyer, uh, the, the buyer wouldn't be held responsible, only the person that purchased the last property. Because if somebody approached the buyer, if the creditor approached the buyer and said, you owe me land of which you bought, it, there was a property lien on it, he could turn around and say, listen, I left you tracts of land from the debtor at which you could collect. There was still land available. So you need to go directly to him. It's not my responsibility. It's only the person that purchased the last land uh, that he should have checked. So whether or not it was a person, in other words, uh, th three, uh, three different people and, a per uh, and an individual or one person that purchased the last property of land. Okay, so here we're dealing with a case in which a single buyer purchased the superior land last. And hence he is allowed, he's content to allow each creditor to collect the land which is due so they do not or collect superior land. And Rav Shesha said, the Bryson speaks of a case in which the buyer purchased superior land lost. So this is obviously an ideal case where uh, there's going to be a problem because the, uh, the buyer, a single buyer that purchased the superior land lost, doesn't want that land to be collected for the kutub of a woman or no. uh, for a lender. I mean, it's he's, he's fine, he's fine if it was somebody for damages. Does that make sense? Because that's what he owes. But he doesn't feel it's fair to pay back a lender or the kutub of a woman off the land he bought lost. He wants mm -hmm. to basically say that he wants to give each of them according to what is due their tract of land. So the Gamola challenges this explanation. And it says, but if so, let all the creditors come and collect from the superior land. So the Gemara says, uh, they give quite a clever answer. It says they can't do so for the buyer can tell them, if you remain silent and take according to your due, the quality of land which you have received 
had you collected from the data. But if not, rather you insist on taking the superior land, which I purchased last, I, re I will return the deed of sale of the inferior land to its original owner, and you will all be forced to take from the inferior land. So let me explain to you what's going on here. Uh, but, Michael, let me just let me just explain. Okay. Okay. Sorry, man. Sorry. So you no come to me, um, you come to me, Michael, and you turn around to me, and you are um, a lender, uh, mm -hmm. and you and you lend money to the person I purchased the money uh, the land from, and you say that you want the superior quality of land, and I turn around to you and I said, Mark, I'm not going to give you superior quality land. I'm prepared to give you average quality land. That's that's what's due. I own three tracts of land. I bought the superior quality of land for, uh, last, I agree with you. But I also own, and I bought from the same buyer, inferior and average quality land. So I'm not going to take the hit here. And you say, but I don't care. That was the property you bought last, and therefore you didn't leave it unencumbered for me. Uh, because had, had you bought the, uh, had there been land left, and, and you left that superior land with the data, I could have collected superior land from the data. But you bought the superior land, so I'm collecting it from you. And I'm turning around to you and I'm saying it's not fair. You're only entitled to average land. And you said, well, buddy, if you never bought it, I could have collected that superior land from the mm. data. And I'm saying, actually, you're only entitled to average land. And before you and I can have an argument, I'm turning around to you, Michael, and I'm saying to you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to return the title deed of the inferior land to the original owner. Not only are you not going to get superior land, you're not even going to get average land in which you're entitled. Now you're going to take the worst land. You're not going to be able to grow cactus on that land. Yeah, we don't okay. even grow on that land. I'm going to return that back to the original debtor, whom I bought the land from. Your issue is with them. Now try and collect inferior land. So either you can uh, collect average land, as is your due, or otherwise I'm going to return the title deed of the inferior land and do a Kenyan, an acquisition, where uh, the, I get the base team to force the debtor to take back the land with an acquisition and the stock, and we reverse the, uh, the, okay. the issue. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, good. Gavin, Kevin, Arthur, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Kevin? Yeah, Arthur? yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So so then the case of it is the same what happened with the woman's ketubah. She suddenly gets greedy. She said, you know what? The marriage with Oak is in the picnic. I went through a lot of uh, hassles and griefs with the guy. By the way, you bought the, quality, uh, the superior land last. You bought it last. I want superior land. And he's going to say the same thing. He's going to say the argument's going to reassert itself. And he's going to say, listen, I'm going to return the inferior title deed. And she can't say anything because there's no reason why he shouldn't do that. He might as well. She's only entitled to inferior quality land. Okay, does that, does that make sense, guys? So it yeah. can't actually be yeah. uh, enforced in this particular way. We can see in certain cases that time periods that elapse, etc., that the last buy of superior land is stuck with a dead turkey. But we can also see that it could really work out very badly for somebody with regards to damages. Okay, let me explain to you why. We on 8B1. And what it says here, well, what it happens with regards to damages. So, Michael, say you, you, you uh, Gavin, no, 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 Kevin, say, say I damaged your ox, right? And uh, not, not I. Say, say the debtor uh, damaged your ox. And then I bought the superior quality land and you came to me and you wanted to claim superior quality land. Okay, Kevin, I could turn around to you and either give you superior quality land, but if I'm a buyer and I'm not a nice person, I could turn around and say, I'm going to give you average land. And you could turn around to me and say, but you're entitled to give me superior quality land. A, because you bought it last uh, and you left no unencumbered properties, but B, because I'm a damaged case, I, I'm a damages action case, and I'm entitled to superior quality land. And I'm going to turn around to you and say, listen, I want you to take average land. Otherwise, I'm going to return the inferior property title deed back to the debtor. 
And never mind that you can't collect uh, superior land. You're going to be stuck with inferior land. So why don't you rather just take my average land? I'm not giving you superior, nothing doing. What are you going to do about it? Guys, what do you think you can do about it? Well, um, nothing. Nothing, exactly. Nothing. Nothing. So it's, yeah. Nothing. Things but most people... Happen are not that rogue, meaning they, 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 they'll steal a bit, but not a whole lot. Let me give you an example. The buyer's kind of ticked off that he was stuck buying a land that, that now he is worth nothing because it got basically taken by the debtor. So he's feeling in a ticked off mood. Does that make sense? And he's not feeling reasonable. The, the person that's damaged is feeling very unreasonable because now he's having to settle for average quality land. But it's very rare that the buyer will be completely uh, immoral and, and just return the title deed for inferior pr uh, property. Generally, people will, will, will take advantage, but not to that degree. Does that make sense? They want to feel like a tzaddik, even though they behave like a rosha. They won't <laughs> actually um, uh, return the inferior title deed. So the price is now saying, okay, so what happens if we have a situation uh, that the damaged party does collect from superior land. What case are we dealing with here? This is an A to B3. So it's clearly saying we're not dealing with the case of a standard uh, buyer because a buyer is going to turn around and force the damaged party to take average land or else, he, or else he's going to return the inferior title deed back to the debtor. It's saying we're dealing with the case here where the debtor died and left his estate in the hands of orphans who are not responsible to pay for their father's debt. Mm -hmm. And the father's debt obligation rests, rests solely with the buyer. Therefore, it cannot be said that the Bryce's ruling is based on the stratagem of returning the deed of the inferior land to the orphans of the debtor. The question yeah. previously raised therefore reasserts itself. And if the buyer purchased the superior land lost, why is it that all the creditors cannot collect from this land? Does that make sense, guys? It's a very straightforward case. In other words, in other words, he can't use that technique in a case, for example, where the uh, the debtor died because the children are not responsible for paying for the father's deeds. Therefore, who's stuck with this problem? The buyer. The buyer is stuck with the problem. So, in this particular case, he can't have the strategy of returning the inferior uh, property back. So what the question reasserts itself. So what's going to happen here? Rather, the reason that the creditors do not collect from superior land is because the buyer can say to them, what's the reason that the rabbis said that the creditors can't collect payment from encumbered properties? It's in a case where there are encumbered properties in the debtor's possession, i.e. it's for my buyer's benefit, but I do not wish to avail myself of this enactment, as this will cause me a loss. Let me explain to you what it's saying here, guys. It's saying that the incumbent property law is to protect the buyer. What, what, why are we saying it's to protect the buyer, this rabbinical enactment? Because if you buy a tract of land and people are coming to you for the debtor who sold you that land, it's all their problems, you as the buyer need to be protected. So what's one of the rabbinic enactments? It says as the buyer, you're responsible to make sure that there's a tract of land that you're purchasing that is still left to the previous party. Do you get what I'm saying? In other words, Marco, I'm buying land from you. And I'm buying no. land from Gavin or Kevin or Arthur. Okay, so Arthur, I'm buying land from you now. Okay. And you've got three tracts of land. And as long as I'm leaving you with one tract of land, whoever you owe money to, you will satisfy their claim. It's not okay. my problem. In other words, even if it's for damages and you owe them superior quality land, but you only have inferior left and I bought you superior quality land. It's not my problem because you in fact have the issue to pay back what you owe. And as the buyer, I'm buying it and leaving you with a tract of land. Therefore, even if somebody damaged you, or uh, you damaged somebody's property or you uh, have to pay back a loan, you can pay them back with the inferior land that you've got left because that's all you have left. But as a buyer, it's not my problem that they never got right. the rate of land that they were entitled to. As a buyer, okay. you need to be protected. But what it's saying here is if I bought all three grades of land 
um, I can I can actually revoke that uh, incumbent properties law because that rabbinical enactment to protect me as a buyer no longer suits me. If I bought the superior quality land last, it doesn't suit me now to satisfy everybody's claims with the superior quality land. I don't mind uh, satisfying the land, uh, the claim of the damager because he's entitled to it. But in terms okay. of somebody else's, and I'm not happy with that either, Mark, but I don't have a choice. But in order to satisfy the damage of a woman's ketubah or mm -hmm. of a lender with superior quality land, I'm going to feel really, really badly damaged. And therefore, that rabbinic enactment was for my benefit. So if I bought all three grades of land, I can choose to revoke that benefit because it doesn't suit me at this stage. You can renounce that. But, but you you're saying you can get, you can say, well, I'll give back the inferior land to the, to the, uh, to the person I bought it from. No, no, no. What you can say, what it's saying is, if a guy bought the superior quality land lost, okay, mm. and he's got all three tracts of land, he doesn't have to honour. He, he, again, this is a person that bought all three tracts of land, but yeah, he bought the yeah. superior land lost. He doesn't have to honour the lender or the kutub of a woman with superior quality land if they came to him. Okay, so if somebody came and he said, the person you bought it from owed me money. I want the mm. superior quality land because you bought it last. He doesn't yeah. have to go through this whole game and strategy with them. He just, he can give them average quality land. Why? When he bought all three grades of land, he, can, he is entitled to revoke that rabbinic enactment for the buyer's benefit, where he, page, he, pages, he pays back each of the damage, uh, each of the creditors with the land that is due to them. Yeah. Meaning, but, but, meaning but it goes back just uh, yeah, guys. Let me think. It goes mm -hmm. back to the case mm -hmm. where if he bought it simultaneously, remember, mm -hmm. if one person bought it simultaneously, he pays each cre uh, creditor what is due their particular land. Yeah. If he bought, so it goes back to that default position if he chooses, because mm -hmm. the unencumbered property law was for the buyer's benefit. Now it doesn't suit the buyer because he bought superior quality land lost. Are you with me, Gavin? 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 Gavin, are you there? Gavin? I can't hear you. It doesn't matter. Uh, all right. So what, what I was going to say is he can revoke the rabbinic enactment and he can go back to a position where he um, can, can uh, go to the default position if he owns all three tracts of land and pay each respective uh, creditor with the land that is due to him. Does that make sense? And we're just going to have one proof of evidence of this. Guys, can you all hear me? Because it seems like the Zoom session became unstable. I can't hear any of you. Arthur? Idea. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Look, I'm not sure the. Uh, I, I I don't need a lot of time at all. I just want to tell you where we were holding and then we done. All right. So base basically that uh, rabbinic enactment next to last was for the buyer's benefit, right? So that the buyer wouldn't be stuck with all the debt. So as long as there was an unencumbered property in the debtor's possession, the buyer would be okay. Um, now, obviously, the person that bought the property last, um, if they didn't have the courtesy to check the, or the intelligence to check that the uh, debtor, uh, the person they purchased the land from, didn't have any uh, guarantees in place, or uh, didn't check their history, etc. the last buyer is stuck with a problem because the last buyer should have left attractive land so that the debtor could satisfy any uh, claimant. Okay, so this is a case where one person bought all the grades of land in succession. If one person bought all the lands simultaneously, each uh, one of the creditors would be paid from that land, meaning the buyer would have to satisfy... Uh, the previous landowners uh, damages actions from superior quality land, uh, the lender uh, from average and the woman's ketubah from inferior. But when he bought the land in succession, 
the last land that he bought was superior. Um, and he would ordinarily go through this game we discussed of having to threaten um, the creditors that he would return the title deed of inferior quality land unless they accept the land that was due to them. And that they couldn't get greedy and now say that he had to pay them superior land because there was no land unencumbered by the original debtor and landowner. So what's what's actually saying here is that the Gemara offers a different answer that he doesn't need to use these sort of strategies to, to get them to collect from uh, their correct grade of land because that rabbinic enactment that they cannot collect payment from, unenc- from encumbered properties is um, where the unencumbered properties in the debtor's possession falls away if the buyer doesn't want to use that benefit, meaning it was put in place in order to protect the buyers so that a person that bought could go back and say there was land to collect from the original debtor. But if all three grades of land were purchased and the superior land was purchased last by one buyer, he could in fact uh, revoke that enactment and let each person collect from the land of grade, uh, grade of land that they were entitled to. Does that make sense, guys? We nearly finished. Yeah. Any questions? Michael, Arthur? No. Cool. Fine. So, um, cool. so where is evidence for this? It's in accord with the ruling of Rava. For Rava said, whoever declares I do not wish to avail myself of a rabbinic enactment instituted for my benefit, in, such, in a case such as this, we comply with his wishes. Okay. And we're going to see an example where uh, this occurs. So, There's a case where the Gomorrah elaborates on Rava's statement. To what did Rava refer when he said in such a case as this? He was referring to a case such as the one discussed by Rav Huna. For Rav Huna said, a woman may say to her husband, I will not receive food from you and I will not work and give you my income. So let me just tell you what this is about. When a woman gets married, okay, what actually happens is her husband uh, feeds her and clothes her and looks after her. And in return, she gives him her income. Does that make sense? In many cases in those days, people were seamstresses and they didn't earn a lot of money. This is in uh, Ketubot 83a. So what would happen then is that he would collect the little money she earned and then contribute it to the household. And in return, he would feed her and uh, look after her. But what happens if she was a high-powered businesswoman? She could revoke that and say to her husband, I don't want to receive food from you, and I will uh, not work and give you my income. In other words, I will keep my income, and you can keep your food. Why did that rabbinic enactment occur to start with? In other words, so that a husband would have a financial obligation to look after his wife by feeding her, clothing her, and housing her. And then in return, if she worked, she could contribute to giving him some money back and and helping him in some manner. But in a case where she earned far more than the benefit she would receive from him, she could choose to revoke that rabbinic enactment and keep the money and buy her own food, etc., now, why can she revoke that rabbinic enactment? Firstly, who was the rabbinic enactment done for? The husband or the wife? Uh, for the wife. Absolutely, why? Yeah, for the wife, but also for the marriage. No, Gav, it's a straightforward answer. It's the wife. It's more for the wife, but it protects the family as well. I mean, no, it's it shalom buys. No, Gav, let's not get to an abstract answer. Let's just deal with an answer. Does it suit the husband or the wife? Let me phrase the question better. No, the the wife. wife. Great. Obviously, it's Shalom Bayit. I mean, that's that's obvious. I'm saying, who does it suit? Let's give the legal case clear. It suits the wife because the, the husband is legally obligated and morally to look after his wife. But the reason why the woman might prefer to uh, revoke the rabbinic enactment is because her earnings far surpass what she'd receive in food support. And therefore, she wishes to pay for her own support and keep the balance of the income. 
Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but does she still contribute to household expenses, though? In other, in, in other words, yes. If she keeps, if she, in other words, there's only two situations, guys, and they're both done for the benefit of the wife. The first rabbinic, the rabbinic enactment says that the husband legally has to feed his wife, and that if she works, he can keep her income. Because in most cases, there, the husbands would earn more than the wife, so he would take care of her, not just food, he'd take care of her housing, and all her needs, her clothing, etc. And whatever work she did, a little bit of income, he could take it back to offset some of his losses and costs. Does that make sense? Fine. Yeah. And this was done for her benefit. But if she was a high-powered business person and and he just uh, um, he just wasn't very good at business or he didn't earn a lot of money and he had a small laboring job, then she can say, I don't want to receive food or benefits from you. I will keep my income uh, and I will take care of myself. So she could revoke that rabbinic enactment to take care of her uh, and uh, give him the income in return for food, etc. Whichever position suited her, she could do. And and right. this is w- what Rav was saying in the case of Rav Huna. He was saying in the case that the buyer can choose to have that uh, uh, first to last enactment so that he would be protected that he left the person with a he left the original landowner with a grade of land. And even even uh, the person that bought the uh, a second bar that bought the property, as long as the uh, original debtor had some tract of land, and he maybe was the second guy to buy, but there was still a tract of land, and um, then it was for the buyer's protection. But if one buyer bought all the land, but he happened to only buy the superior land last, he doesn't want the rabbinic uh, enactment because in this case it's to his detriment to have to pay from superior quality land when in fact he's got all three grades of land does that make sense and he doesn't want to pay a lender or the kutub of a woman with superior quality land just because he bought it first because he's got the other two grades of land he said guys come collect what what's due to you but I don't want to yeah. have the rabbinic enactment of first to last because in this case it doesn't suit me as the buyer I'm the one that owns three tracts of land. I don't want to pay you from Superior. Yeah. Any questions, guys? And then we can finish. No, We're done. no, very, very clear. Very clear. Thank you. Very clear. Thanks. Kev, you okay, buddy? I'm going to have to go over it. It's a lot of info, but it's, uh, I've seen it. Yeah. All right. Listen, you are going to have to go over it, but we did well. We, we still have 8B2 and 8B3 outstanding. Again, there was one day that we had to repeat because of a bad recording and people weren't feeling well. So I would have loved to have finished the eighth uh, duff, but it's not meant to be uh, today. And it's not meant to be this week. We're going to have to do it on Sunday. So instead of Sunday being uh, Yom Rishon, it seems that Sunday is going to be the end of the week where we're going to finish the last part of the duff. All right, guys, I wish you a a super Shabbat. Yeah. But the tit said what you said before you yes, sign off. Yes, with pleasure, with pleasure. You were saying, because you said it briefly, that uh, you should wait, sit, obviously, in the morning when you dove and shuffle it. Yes. Ideally, you should wait, sit, sit all day. Until You're night absolutely night. correct. I wasn't, I wasn't implying that you okay, should. Okay, but is there, oh, there was no leniencies in terms of, as long as you wait for shuffle as a minimum. No, no, no. Ke- uh, Kevin, you're 100% right. Let me tell you what, I, you are 100% right. The ideal is you wear tzitzit sit all day, okay? Yeah. Absolutely ideal. I'm saying you've got a person that's not going to wear tzitzit sit at all, or you've got a person that's going to turn around and say, listen, just like I can put on uh, to, uh, to fill in for five minutes a day, I can first put on tzitzit, sit, fulfill that obligation of a four-corner garment blessing, and then put on to fill in, and I fulfill the obligation for the day. And, and, and it's encouraging somebody that's not at the level where they're going to keep it on full day. It's better than doing nothing. Oh, Is okay. it ideal? No. It's ideal to wear uh, it sits at full time. But you've still fulfilled the obligation of doing the brocha daily oh, okay. in four-cornered garment. Sure, and... Yeah, I mean, so what I'm saying in the morning is that there's a tradition not to do it at... You can't... Uh, you don't, there's not a halachic obligation to wear tzitzit at night. 
Because again, yeah. one of the discerning factors of wearing tzitzit is that with the lights are off, you can discern between tzitzit, that blue color, uh, versus white color. You can discern colors, or you can discern a familiar face from four cubits. So because you can't do that at night, there's no rabbinic enactment to wear both tzitzit at night, tzitzit katan, the actual tzitzit, or a talus. Nobody governs on Friday night with a talus unless you're the shaliach tzibli that you're davening for the community. Do you get what I'm saying? So there's no obligation. Many people even have a custom that they only take off their tzitzit when they go to bed. Uh, so there's extreme and there's uh, halachic and then there's reform and there's, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> trying, I'm trying to just say that you can fulfill your halachic obligation when it takes you two minutes to do tzitzit, uh, to fill in, is to do sit sit prior. To do the brocha, that's it, you're done. If you find it itchy and scratchy, you're done. Does that make sense? People can take it off if, if it really Yes, is, uh... there's just one thing I want to mention with regards to the filling. Because I had with a very close friend of mine a, a, a conversation that I considered a very deep philosophical issue. And it's something that everybody that's conscious should struggle uh, with because this person is a very conscious person and a very conscientious person. And they don't want to be disingenuous, a close friend of mine where they're putting on tefillin and not feeling that feeling of loving towards Hashem. They've had a bad day. They've had a really difficult time. They've had a bad month or a bad succession of months. And sometimes you don't feel yeah. super close and you don't want to turn around and say, I love you. I'm feeling close to you. You don't want to do it falsely. You don't want to put them to fill in and have this feeling where you're saying one thing and lacking integrity where you don't feel that degree of closeness and you're feeling a little bit of frustration and resentment and, and, and basically unloved by Hashem. So how do you, how do you, what do you take that mental um, uh, position that you are? And not feel disingenuous when you're putting on to fill in and feel like you're making a false statement and living out of integrity. So this issue I do want to address because I think it's a very, very important issue. I don't know if any of you guys have thought about it, but I've thought about it often. And then I realized that one of the things you've got to bear in mind is that you've got to simplify the question. Your Yatesahora is a very tricky little creature. What the Yetzirah does is it tries to separate you and Hashem. That's the entire, the Satan in Hebrew means obstruction. If you remember Gavin and Derech Hashem, it meant the word obstruction. It's obstructing the relationship between you and Hashem. Hashem has given it a commandment to uh, put on Tefillin. And therefore Hashem says that for whatever reason, whether you understand the reason or not, I want you to put on Tefillin. Therefore, please put on Tefillin whether you feel that sort of feeling or not. And that's what I'm expecting f from you, uh, my children, to do. Now, the conflict is that if you don't feel that way, you feel like you're lying when you're putting on tefillin, or you don't feel that you're feeling this loving closeness. Not that you're lying, but you don't really feel the feelings. And what I'm saying is the Yetzirah is using this as a trick to separate you from Hashem because you're responsible for not fulfilling that particular mitzvah. Does that make sense? So therefore, you've got to ignore uh, your Yetzirah because your Yetzirah, as you become more sophisticated, is coming along the guise of being a tzaddik. What do I mean a tzaddik? It's saying, listen, you need to be a genuine person. You need to live in integrity. You can't say one thing and do another. You've got to live your life uh, consistently, that your thoughts have to mimic your deeds. But that Yetzirah, in this case, is tricking you because even if you don't have the feelings, you're meant to follow orders. The word mitzvot is a word commandment. You've got to follow orders. That's it. So the higher level is feeling the feeling. The normal level is to do it anyway. Some days you feel closer to him. Some days you don't. But put on to fill in daily anyway. You have it. And how long does it take? How many minutes? Three minutes. That's it. That is all it takes. I think to say shma with it, obviously. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. even then, Kev, uh, okay. when you say shma, if a person isn't in that feeling, let me give you an example. You're iterating love and love and love. Okay? So if you don't feel that, and we English speaking, sometimes you say it in Hebrew because you don't want to feel disingenuous, 
because you feel that you're not living in integrity and you're saying, I love you, I'll do anything for you. You're saying, I don't feel that my needs are being met by you. You can see I'm battling with certain things and you're leaving me here to flounder. This is the mind talk that's going on in the background. And then we know in a, in a higher level, Hashem's our, our loving father and he gives us tests to help us. But sometimes emotionally, we can't cope with this at all. So I'm saying there's a resentment and a love and we go backwards and forwards mm-hmm. and we vacillate. So what I'm saying is don't put on too much obligation for yourself. If you're not ready to do it, you do the tefillin and you say the first uh, chapter of the uh, first verse of the Shema. If you're up to it, you say the second and third. But then don't say that you feel like doing the Amidah because you're going to throw everything away. Now, now, anybody listening is going to turn around and say, Damon, you're encouraging people not to say that Amidah, the Shmone. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if you're at the level where you're going to throw everything away because it's all too much, if you have to say the Shema, then you have to do the Amidah, then you have to do a Lainu, and it never mm-hmm. ends, and you can't do this. And you, and you say, I'm not interested anymore. Okay? That's was- too overwhelming. It's too overwhelming. Too much, so time. what you have to do is trick your yates of horror here and do whatever you can, but do to fill in and do at least the first bracha of the Shema. Thanks. Sorry, did anybody have any questions? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was just thinking, Damien, as you're talking, even in the Shema, yes. um, I, you know, it says love, you, love, love God with all your hearts. Um, but I think the, the, the word, I think is, I, I, I think it's the, the actual word there is it's got two yuds, if I'm not incorrect. For some way, it has two yuds, which means you've got to love Hashem with uh, two aspects of your heart, which is positive and negative. But in other words, your, your positive inclination and your negative, evil inclination, your negative inclination. So Correct. it's almost like Hashem's aware Correct. that you will have negative emotions, but nevertheless, you're still, still supposed to do it. Yes. Regardless. Yes. So I'm just thinking about that, that in fact, because it's particularly in the Shema that it has that double word, that double Baba thing. Correct. It's been interpreted as both your hearts, you know, your, your two aspects of your heart, your evil and the positive. Absolutely correct. Correct. I just, yeah. I just want to add something just from my experience. I know, I know you do fluctuate day to day, but as you grow as well, you'll find at the beginning it's a voider. It's, it's just work. To put on to fill in, it's a hassle. To say the Shema is a hassle. But over time, on, on most of the days, you start having true, true love for Hashem. Especially when you think about the greatness of how he's created everything. You know, the biggest creation of all is actually existence. Hashem created existence and never actually existed. So this is something that's covered in Derek Hashem. It's, it's remarkable what he's done. So when you see how great the greatness of Hashem, you will start loving him over time and it will get easier. And it, and it changes from a voider to being a voider with love, which is a, obviously a higher, you know, a much higher level to, to achieve. And you should achieve that most days, except for, like Damon said, you have the odd rough day with the customer or something, and you no, can't quite achieve um, it. Gav, I, f- I fully agree with you. The thing is that, is, is that what, what I'm saying is, I'm not disagreeing with you, is that there are levels and levels and levels. So what happens with a lot of from people is they end up doing to fill in, uh, when they get used to it and doing the Shema without any cognizance of thinking about why they're doing it and it becomes routine. So the benefit of that is they get to do the mitzvot, which is amazing, and it becomes a good habit. The bad part is that they're not conscious. See, and I do it in English and I think it helps a lot. Uh, it does help a lot. And I I'm dive t- in every, the majority in English and to me, I think it's a big difference because I, I'd really try to concentrate on that English and on the actual wording, so that I actually know what I'm talking about. It, does, it talks it about does love, love, love. I think it makes it easier. And in fact, uh, the guy that I follow quite a lot is Yosef Mishraki, Rabbi Yosef Mishraki, and he said, if you if, if your Hebrew is not that good and you're not really understanding it, he said, switch to your to, to your mother tongue, like English, because then you're going to understand it. You're going to be able to do it with more more integrity and more uh, honesty and sincerity. So that's just my belief. If you are struggling on a day, rather do it in English. That's my. So sometimes it's not that you're struggling on the day; you're going through a very difficult period in your life. And you going through sometimes diff- it's not just a rotten customer; it's a rotten month, it's a rotten life, it's a rotten test. It's a you're not coping. It's a, 
you know, it's not rotten. It's all for our benefit. But sometimes we don't have the emotional capacity to cope. So it's not like I'm saying you're having an odd day. And all, all I'm saying to you is that um, you have to, just like you don't get out of a marriage or you don't stop loving your kids if you're having marital difficulties, your kids are driving you up the wall. It's a lifelong dedication. It is a lifelong dedication. There are times in a relationship where it's better and there are times in a relationship where it's strained. But you carry on and commit regardless. And that's what I want Great. to say. Hundred percent. And what you said, Damon, as Rabbi Mofson even told me quite a few years ago, yeah. stick with the mitzvah. If you like a civilian, even if you want to motivate, just keep on doing it. If you if you love doing it and you have a bad period in your life, just stick at it and don't. Uh, eventually, you'll uh, you'll appreciate it. And uh, yeah, don't don't just keep throwing the towel. Yeah. Yeah. But your Yaitzel Hora is going to get more yeah. and it's not, more obviously, I'm, I'm way. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You, you're 100% right, Kevin. I'm saying the problem is this, that you always need to have, it says in Derech Hashem, that we always need to have free choice. And what happens is the more the Yaitzel Torf grows, the more the Yaitzel Hora grows. Because if the Yaitzel Torf grow, grew exponentially out of proportion to the Yaitzel Hora, we would have no more free choice. So in order to keep that balance of free choice, the Yetzir Hora, as you become more conscious, becomes much more sophisticated. And it, it sells you on doubt. It's got a lot of tools at its disposal. One of its disposal tools are doubt. Meaning, uh, when I'm about to give a shir, I turn around to myself and I say, listen, Damon, you're not the Chazanesha. What are you doing? You know, you're good at playing pool. You're good at playing a bit of soccer. You're good at a couple of things. What, what are you doing? You're pretending to be the rabbi of the week. Like, just give it up. What's the matter with you, man? Like, who are you pretending to be? And it's a chick of the Yatsahora where I have to turn around to the Yatsahora and say, you know what? Um, let's play a trick. You love to be on TV. You love ego. Let's give you a little bit of a time where you can go and uh, talk to the guys and you be, can be the one to give the shirt. So I can feed your ego there and then that'll keep you quiet, Yatsahora. <laughs> And then Yetzir Tov, let me do what I want to do and give over Torah and do Hashem's will. So you play games with your Yetzir Hora. You know, a person, a guy that's going to get married, he's terrified of commitment. He doesn't want to get married. But then we have the Yetzir Hora because he says she's a pretty girl. I'd like some quality time with her. He's, at that point, he's not thinking about the kids, the drama, the expenses, the mortgage or whatever. He's saying, yeah, I want to get intimate. I can only do it in Kedush. All right, let me marry the girl. So the Yetzir Hora is also used to get us to make a commitment to marriage because otherwise if guys actually thought about the consequences, they'd be terrified. So in other words, the Yetzirah can be used to enable us as well as disarm us. And we used to trick the Yetzirah and saying, all right, Yetzirah, you want to get what you want out? I want you to get married in Kedusha, but you like this girl, she's pretty. Let's agree to be on the same page here and marry the girl so you can get what you want and my Yetzir Tov can get to spend my soul's journey with her and you can get luck to, to be with the pretty girl. Or, or right, Yetzir Hora, you turn around and saying, I'm being pre pretending here to be the role for whatever. I must stop being ridiculous. I must go back to playing soccer or do whatever it is that I do. And my Yetzir Tov will turn around to my Yetzir Hora and my Yetzir Tov wants to serve Hashem, says to the Yetzir Hora, all right, you want to be on YouTube, you want to give Shirim and have some leadership with the guys and show your ego. Fine, let you play that game and let's be on the same page and give the Shir. So you're having this constant sparring with your Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Hora. And the trick is to use your Yetzir Hora to serve your Yetzir Tov. You're not meant to negate it to the position that it doesn't exist. And the reason being is there was a discussion in the Gomorrah where the Yetzir Hora was taken off. Do you remember what happened? The ch your chicken stopped laying eggs. Because didn't laying eggs, yeah. People never it. got out of bed. Because unless you turn around and say, I like his house. I like his Porsche. I want to work hard. I want those things. You'll never get out of bed. I like the girl. I want to get married. I want to have intimacy or whatever. You won't be motivated to do anything unless your Yetzir Hora kicks in. So you've got to use your Yetzir Tov and your Yetzir Hora to serve Hashem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to www.porsche.com right now. All right, guys. <laughs> have, a, have, a good, uh, have a good Shabbos. And Thank I you. hope this was uh, useful. It was no, an embarrassing good. shear for me to give. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. No, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Eh? Pleasure, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, refresh Lamer to 
to you, Michael. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank still around. Sure. Yeah, just to tell you guys, you're, great, you're a great bunch of guys. I really enjoy studying with you. Thank Likewise. you for studying with all of you. I enjoy, I miss and, you, and, my and, friends. And, and being with you, and being with you every day is just fantastic. Thank you. No, likewise. We're all enjoying it. And uh, it's a great group. Fantastic group. And I, Amen, I hope this group lasts for a long time. Amen. 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 Cheers, guys.